<clears throat> I guess we'd like to try to get started. And uh, so I'd like to welcome all of you. Uh, for those of you who made the trip here, as well as for those of you, I know there's several out there on the internet receiving bits from the event. So I'd like to welcome all of you. My name is Jan Odegaard. I'm the executive director of the Computer and Information Technology Institute at RISE. Um, it is with great pleasure I welcome all of you to the second lecture in this lecture series, Technology, Society, and Public Policy. Uh, this was uh, a lecture conceived and brought to you by the Baker Institute of Public Policy, the Computer and Information Technology Institute, and uh, the Office of the Chief Librarian at RISE. Uh, quite timely event in terms of uh, uh, the kinds of issues that the lecture series overall is trying to address. This lecture series aims to highlight the challenges we face as our cyber society matures with an eye toward issues related to the impact, ownership, use, control, and management of information and information technology in society. And one of the topics that we're discussing today is certainly relevant for that purpose. Many of you probably attended the lecture in the spring or side over the internet uh, on e-voting. E e uh, this is an election year. Uh, a lot of the requests came for having sort of a follow-up lecture on that, and so we're together here today to, to do that, just that. And uh, all of us are concerned about, will my vote count? And uh, that's an issue that we all are concerned about. Uh, I can't vote yet, but uh, <laughs> as you might detect from my East Texas accent. <laughs> <laughs> it's very far east. <laughs> um, so today's event will... Uh, Follow, uh, the following sort of model. Dan Wallach, uh, he's the assistant professor in computer science at RISE, will give a keynote presentation. Uh, follow up that presentation, Honorable Scott Hochberg will give a few remarks, about five minutes. Uh, then uh, the Travis County clerk, uh, Dana De Beauvais, will follow with some remarks. Then Tony Cervello, which has, uh, let me see here, I need to read this from the manuscript. He was the former advisor of elections for Harris County and currently is the executive director of the International Organization of Election Officials. So it's uh, certainly quite relevant for the topic of the day. And then at the end of the table, we have Kathy Mitchell. She's from the Consumer Union Southwest Regions Office. So I'm very pleased to have all of you here. Uh, and after they've all made their comments, we'll open the, for questions and discussions following that. After there is a, the, the event in here is over, we'll convene out in, the, in the, the comments and there will be refreshments and we can continue a dialogue with everybody. So with no more ado, I'd like to, it's with great pressure to introduce today's speaker, Dan Wallet. Dan's research involves computer security and the issues of building secure and robust software systems for the internet. Dan, uh, along with colleagues at John Hopkins, co-authored a groundbreaking study that revealed significant flaws in a particular voting e-voting system. And that's certainly at the base of some of his discussions. He has testified about voting security issues before government bodies in Texas, Ohio, and the European Union. Dan, the mic is yours. All right. <coughs> Thank you very much. Let's see. I think this thing means that my water cup doesn't fall. Cool. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you also to the Baker Institute for promoting me to associate professor, which hopefully my department will as well. Your flyer has the wrong <laughs> um, Thank you to my administration and the legal counsel of Rice University and the Electronic Frontier Foundation for defending some of the work that I've done, which allows me to talk to you and to audiences all around the world about it instead of sitting in jail for violating a vendor's trade secrets. Um, I have, it's amazing what a journey this has been. Two years ago, I never would have imagined that I'd be speaking to audiences at, as diverse as the Bell County Republican Convention or the, um, the election officials in Mexico or the European Union or everywhere else that I've been, you know, even from, you know, who knew that I would be on TV answering questions from CNN's Lou Dobbs? It's been a wild ride. However, it's, it's gratifying to have attention paid to an important issue, but not a whole lot has been done to address the issue. And that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. I'm gonna be talking about some of the problems with traditional voting systems, and we're gonna, I'll briefly go over some of the different voting technologies that are used here in the US and elsewhere my opinion of how we should fix them. 
I'll tell you briefly about our work where we studied the Diebold voting system. And because everybody wants to know, I'll tell you what all of you can do. So why don't we start with the problem everybody's most familiar with? This is a picture of the butterfly ballot from Florida. So this is, uh, underneath this is a punch card, and what the voter is supposed to do is follow the, look at the name who they want to vote for, follow the arrow, and punch the hole. Now, the human factors issue with this is subtle, but if you want to vote for Al Gore or Joe Lieberman, you might start counting from the left and say one, two, and then start counting the holes, one, two, and punch the hole that corresponds to Pat Buchanan which was probably not who you actually wanted to vote for. <laughs> so that's an example where the technology as such works just fine, but it has some accuracy issues. Another problem with punch cards that you're all certainly familiar with is the hanging chad issue. There are these, there's a picture of some hanging or dangling or whatever chad in the bottom corner of the slide. Another problem that you might be less familiar with that's a photograph of the underside of a punch card voting machine. And notice how the hole for, for Al Gore happened to land on top of that plastic cross brace, which means that the Gore chads would pile up in the hole. And when you heard complaints about old people not being strong enough to push it through, it wasn't because they were lacking you know, enough newtons of force. It's because there was nowhere for the chad to go. So, but what, I, what I'm really concerned about, and what is perhaps the, the most relevant to, to today's discussion, is the concept of fraud and how you might go about defrauding an election system. So when you have mail-in voting, for example, we've had cases from Texas in the 1940s where the dead came back to vote for Lyndon Johnson. Likewise, the dead in Chicago seem to vote on a regular basis. <laughs> Whenever you have something that occurs outside of the polling place, then you have an opportunity for a wide variety of fraudulent things to occur because you don't have the controls that somebody walked in and signed their name. Now, in Texas, relatively few people vote by mail. In Oregon, everybody votes by mail. It's the only way to vote. 70% in Washington state, 40% in California, similar numbers elsewhere. Well, the only reason why that might work in Oregon is perhaps because they're very polite or maybe they're dead or you know, more quiet. But this wouldn't work on, as a national model. Another ugly failure mode that we have to worry about is not just tampering that might occur at the, at the ballot box in the voting precinct. We need, it's a perfectly legitimate concern to, to be worried about what might occur in Election Central. Could an election official tamper with the results in a wholesale fashion, rather than just throwing one or two votes you know, casting a vote for your dead grandmother, perhaps an election official could cast votes for thousands or tens of thousands of people's dead grandparents, or maybe change your votes. Would you know? Likewise, an important concern is the notion of bribery or coercion. If there's some way that you can prove to a third party how you voted, then that's the way that you can sell your vote, you know, vote for my candidate and I'll pay you $10, or it's a way that you could be bribed, or coerced, rather. Vote for my candidate or I'll break your kneecaps. And these are all important reasons, important things that you have to take into mind when you're, when you, when you're engineering a better voting system. Probably the best voting technology we've got today are so-called optical scan systems. These are not punch cards, even though they are paper. These systems are very transparent, which is to say how they work is obvious on site. You have these pieces of paper, and you either fill in the bubble or connect the dots with a black pen, and then you shove it into the ballot box. It's very simple. It's anybody who observes the process can convince themselves that it's working in a meaningful way. This particular system has another benefit. On top of that ballot box, there's a computer, and what that computer does is it scans the ballot on the way in. If it detects that you've accidentally voted for more than one candidate, it says, well, that's an error. You're not allowed to vote for more than one candidate. And it kicks it back out. In Texas, you'd get three tries to get it right. And other states have similar rules. And because it can catch certain kinds of user errors, that means it has much better accuracy. And, oh, by the way, if for whatever reason the computer malfunctions, 
you have all that paper around, which means you can go back and recount it. And even you can also audit the election that way. It gives you more evidence to convince yourself that even the electronic tally was accurate. But we're not here to, because of that, we're here to talk about electronic voting. The lesson that many people unfortunately thought they learned from Florida was, well, if paper is bad, then maybe a lack of paper is good. So there, there are two main forms of paperless voting. Voting over the internet, that's how Rice students elect the parking gates to be the homecoming queen. <laughs> um, and it seems to work pretty well for that purpose. But for electing the President of the United States, there might be some fraud issues with that. You know, by and large, Rice students just aren't, don't care enough to be bribing people to vote in any particular way. So apathy is a good thing. Um, but when we're talking about a national election, apathy is the last of our problems. Instead, what we're concerned about is tampering with the, with, with the system. People, if, if it was on the internet, somebody could break into your computer. Heaven only knows what they could do. So I'm not really going to talk about internet voting today. I'm going to focus on voting in the polling place on some kind of electronic voting machine. The phrase that you'll often hear is DRE, which stands for Direct Recording Electronic, which implies that it records directly to bits rather than to paper. These are pictures of two different vendors. Here in Harris County we, and also in Travis County, we use the one on the right. So, put on my marketing hat for a minute. Why would we want to use these systems? Well, just as in the scanner for the optical scan, it can, it can prevent overvoting. It's simply not possible for you to vote for more than one candidate. If you click on one name and then the next one, it'll deselect the first one. At the end, it can give you a screen that shows you all the names, and if you forgot to vote for railroad commissioner, or constitutional amendment number 37, it'll, it can highlight it and say, are you sure you didn't mean, are you sure you meant to leave this one blank? And because it's a computer, it can have large type, it can be in any language, and it can have a headphone jack, which makes it accessible for people with a variety of disabilities. And because it's new, you don't have some 50-year-old lever machine where the, the company that built it is long gone, and at the end of the election, you open up the door and there's gears lying on the bottom, and some poor guy in a machine shop has to pick up this broken gear and figure out what it used to look like and machine a new part. Also, if you support the idea of approval voting, instant runoff voting, any voting scheme where you rank the candidates rather than simply choosing your one favorite, then you love computers because computers, it's a simple matter of changing the software to help you express your preferences. Now, just like there are obvious benefits, there are obvious flaws. What indication is there to you, the voter, that your vote is, is counted at the end of the election the way that you cast it in the booth? There's no piece of paper that you drop in a box where you have some confidence that that piece of paper might survive through to be recounted. Why should you trust that the computer worked? There's simply no evidence. You're, you're in, everything happens inside the box. So, here's a map that I, I stole from an Economist article that just appeared today. From the, you know, so, I'm probably violating their copyright. So, people on the internet, please don't tell. Um, this is a map of what machines are being used in different parts of the country. So, you see that Texas has a patchwork of different systems. The bulk of the state is actually vote, voting on some form of optical scan system. Whereas other states, like Georgia and Maryland and Nevada, the whole state is doing the same thing. Well, Nevada's a special case. We'll talk about them a little bit more in a minute. So what you might see is a wide variety of diversity. Every state is a world unto itself. Election law is a, is a state thing, not a federal thing. So how accurate are these things? Unfortunately, I can't go put electrodes in the brains of all the voters and measure how they really wanted to vote and compare that to what was recorded. But one of the things that we can measure is how many people leave something blank. Now, in an election like we have here, where we're going to have 50 or 60 issues, many people are going to leave things blank, some even on purpose. But if we look at an election that was, where there was less on the ballot, we might see something more interesting. So these are figures from the recall election in California that gave us Governor Schwarzenegger. 
a very entertaining election if ever there was one. So these are the residual or undervote rates. So this was, they, remember, voters were asked two questions. One, recall the governor, yes or no. And two, who do you want to replace the governor in the event that he's recalled? So the red bars are averages. So the, the section on the left, those are punch card machines. The section in the middle, those are optical scan systems. The section on the right, those are electronic or DRE voting systems. So what you'll notice is, on average, the DRE systems do seem to be slightly more accurate, although they're not terribly more accurate than the optical scan systems. You know, the ES&S iVotronic ha has an undervote rate of about 3.5%, where the ES&S Eagle, from the same company, their optical scan system is more accurate than their electronic voting system. So you can draw a lot of different conclusions from this data. The conclusion I draw is that it's not intuitively obvious that the electronic systems are fundamentally more accurate. Or maybe whatever benefit you get from being able to check your mistakes and review for errors, whatever benefit you get is canceled out by the confusion that some voters apparently have of using a computer versus a pen and paper. For some reason, people seem to understand pen and paper. Go figure. Now, another reason, now remember how I said that everything is recorded inside the machine. So why should you trust that the machine works? Well, the answer that you will hear is that you should trust it because it's certified. Well, okay then. What does that mean? What does it mean when we say a machine is certified? There are several testing laboratories that, so they're independent testing authorities, they're called, and they are hired by the companies, and the companies pay them to examine the design of their machine, to examine their software, and to give it a stamp of approval. And it's not a gen, it's not a, it's a very specific stamp. It says that this machine meets the Federal Election Commission standards, hopefully of 2002. Now, those standards don't actually say very much about computer security. They leave it very open. So it w it's not a very high bar to get over. And after that, you know, did they find any problems? Did they make any requests that the vendor improve their system? You don't know, I don't know. That's all completely secret. All we get from the, from the testing authorities is one bit, thumbs up or thumbs down, that's it. But Texas and many other states do have this as a mandatory requirement. Texas then tacks on another stage where six people study these systems in a meeting that's held in secret. And the details of that, I imagine Kathy will be talking about more later. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that off for now. But when you put it together, what you get is what we call faith-based voting. Like it or not, you have no, there's nothing that you, there's nothing to help convince you, or me for that matter, that the system works. Instead, you are asked to place your faith that all this process is meaningful. So, a question you might ask yourself is, could an employee of the vendor throw an election? Is it technically feasible? Absolutely. Would there be any evidence? Not if they knew what they were doing. Well, what about these logic and accuracy tests? These machines are tested before the election. Those tests could be easily faked. Logic and accuracy tests will typically cast a couple votes for each candidate, then you add them up and make sure that they work. That's not the same thing as running a full election through the machine. You could easily imagine modifying a computer to behave nicely unless it's been used for enough hours and has enough votes, then that's, that kicks off the cheating behavior. Or maybe you cast a special write-in vote for Mickey Mouse, and it says, ah, oh, Mickey Mouse, and then you get to count your vote, you know, as a, perhaps more. So. How do I argue that you should solve the problem? I believe that paper is essential to elections. And the way, so the, I'm gonna show you three different vendor solutions. I'm not advocating these specific vendors as being great. I'm merely using them as examples of how it could be done. Option one, have a printer attached to your computer. This particular company happily will print onto plain eight and a half by 11 paper. 
although I think it would be better if you had some kind of watermarked official city of Houston, Harris County, Texas paper that would be hard for somebody to walk in with a ream of of their own. <laughs> the computer prints it out. You can look at it, you can hold it in your hands and say, that's who I voted for. And then you can drop it into a ballot box. Because it's a computer, it can have headphone jacks, and it can have buttons with braille type printed on them. It can be made accessible. Turns out this particular vendor, you open it up inside and it's got a regular Lexmark inkjet printer inside. So here's option two. This is uh, the ES&S Automark. This is a, an intriguing system because it prints onto those optical scan ballots I showed you earlier. Where a normal voter might mark on it with a pen, this prints onto it in regular ink. So why would you want that? Well, the Help America Vote Act mandates that by 2006, every precinct must have at least one accessible voting system. So you could buy one of these and have everybody else vote with a pen, and then any voter who might have difficulty using a pen on paper can, can step up and use the machine instead. It has a, the, the vendor was nice enough to picture some headphones next to the machine. It gets accessible, and at the end, it prints onto the same paper ballot that can get counted by the same optical scanner and recounted, et cetera. And you save money because you only need to buy one. The third method is the so-called Mercury method named after Rebecca Mercury. This is a picture of a Brazilian voting machine that, that they used at least in one election. Um, Brazil has been voting electronically for about 10 years. So most Brazilians vote on just the piece on the right. And oh, by the way, the literacy rate in Brazil is much lower than in the US. How do you deal with illiterate voters? Even illiterate voters know how to dial the telephone. So they made it look like a telephone keypad. And in fact, if you happen to be in Brazil and turn on the TV anywhere near an election, you'll hear jingles for the party, for the candidates. I'm told it's very um, annoying. <laughs> Now, Brazil, for reasons I don't entirely understand, canceled this printer attachment. But Nevada used a similar system in, the, in their most recent primary just last week, and it worked great. The idea of a system like this is that the paper is behind glass. You can see it, you can read it, but you can't touch it. The benefit of paper that you can't touch, that's paper that you can't accidentally walk out the door with. So it, it, it also prevents, it makes it very difficult for you to stuff ballots into a sealed system. Now, you have to have some sort of a procedure for dealing with a mistaken vote. If you cast your vote for Alice and the paper says Bob, you need some way of raising your hand and saying there's a problem, and there has to be some procedure where maybe somebody shows up with a key, unlocks the machine, takes the paper out. I don't know exactly how you could do it, but you need a procedure for that, and you could do it. With any of these systems, you get all the human factors benefits of having a computer, the big type, the headphone jacks, multiple languages. And by and large, computers are pretty good at counting. That is what they do for a living. But you should treat those as estimated counts in the same way that when you see at election night and you're watching TV and they say election tallies with 80% of precincts reporting, it's a pretty accurate number, but it's not the final number and you wanna get the final number. For that, you should go back and look at the paper. Because all of this paper was printed by a computer, it can be scanned by another computer. Optical character recognition software is fast and accurate, especially when it doesn't have to deal with people's messy handwriting. And the, the genius of this is now you no longer have to trust the vendor. Even if the vendor is, pop, is, is run by, you know, by, by the party that you despise the most, whichever party that would happen to be, then you don't have to worry about them hiding dirty tricks inside the code of the machine. Either it prints paper that you agree with or not. Paper lives in our world, whereas you and I can't see the bits. That's inside the computer's world. Even if you had x-ray vision, you probably wouldn't be able to tell you know, whether that particular piece of RAM had a one or a zero in it. And as a nice side effect of standardizing on paper, now you can mix and match from vendors. If something breaks with one of your voting machines, if somebody drops it off of a truck and it smashes into a thousand pieces, what do you have to do? You have to go back to the same company you bought the other ones from. And they can charge you whatever, well, whatever your contract hopefully says, 
But if the contract is expired, then they've got you over a barrel. Whereas when you standardize on the paper, any vendor who can print paper of the correct fonts, the correct size, the correct shape can be a drop-in replacement. So standardization can help you save money. So not only is it more secure, it's cheaper. So let's talk briefly about how well electronic voting machines have done in the US. This is a photo of Kathy Cox, the Secretary of State of Georgia, posing with her shiny new D-Bold voting system. So the entire state of Georgia adopted these for November of 2002, which they were Diebold's first major commercial customer. Diebold today has about 30% of the electronic voting machine market, and voting machines are about 29% of how people will vote this November. So about 10% of all votes cast this November will be cast on this particular machine. So now, when I say something interesting happened, I'm not referring to the upset victory where a Republican, a popular Republican senator lost and a popular Republican, sorry, popular Democratic senator lost and a popular Democratic governor lost. What I'm talking about is, a, is the res, what was announced by a woman named Bev Harris. She's an independent reporter out of Seattle. And in March of 03, she announced that she discovered an open FTP site on which she found gigabytes and gigabytes of Diebold stuff. So she made a copy. And by July, she had found serious, amazing security flaws with the global election management system. That's the back end computer that adds up all the votes that come in from the individual voting machines. For starters, it was using Microsoft Access, not even Microsoft's best database system. The audit logs could be trivially bypassed allowing some, you could just connect directly to the database rather than through the front end application, make any changes and the audit logs wouldn't reflect the changes that you'd made. All the users had the same password and the password I think was, it was printed in the manuals so that way it'd be easy for, nobody would have to forget it. <laughs> and that the machine happened to be online so it could feed results to a web server that was feeding results to the press. Which, meant, which means anybody anywhere on the internet could connect to this machine and make all these changes. Now, even if you fix that, well, they also support modems as a way for delivering election results from the precincts back to Election Central. Well, your computer has a modem in it too. You could call that very same modem bank and now you're talking directly to the machine and instead of saying, here's my results, you could say, I'd like to connect to the database, please. So this is not what you would call a very securely designed system. So at the same time, we put together a group of scientists at Rice and at Johns Hopkins, and we decided to go have a look at that source code ourselves. This is what science is all about. If somebody says, we can get cold fusion, look, stir stuff together, free energy. Other people say, oh, let me give that a try. I don't believe you. And sure enough, that particular result turned out to be bogus. Well, scientific method says when somebody has an interesting result, you might go check it out for yourself. And, and so rather, we actually decided to focus most of our attention not on the server software, not on the um, tabulating machine, but on the voting machine, because nobody had looked at that yet. So I'm going to tell you briefly about our results in three general areas. I'm going to tell you about the way they use smart cards, I'm going to tell you about the way they use cryptography, and I'll talk briefly about the quality of their software engineering. So, this is a, a zoom in on that picture. Notice in the bottom right corner, I've circled the smart card slot. The way Diebold machines work during an election is the only thing they're connected to is the wall for power. Otherwise, they're an island unto themselves. Excuse me. So how, how does the voter know that you're, how does the machine know that you're allowed to vote and keep you from voting more than once? The way it works is when you walk into the polling place, you sign your name in the big book, and they hand you a little smart card. This is the same size as the credit cards that all of you have in your pocket, except it's really a complete computer. It has a computer and it, and it can talk to the voting machine. So you walk up to a voting machine, you insert the card, and it says, hi, who would you like to vote for today? You press the buttons, you say that you're done, it shows you a nice patriotic picture of the American flag and gives you the card back. If you try to insert the card twice, it'll say, I'm sorry that card has been used, you can't vote again. There are also some special cards used for some administrative tasks. Well, oops, 
So rather than giving you the detailed summary, I'll just tell you briefly that the way that they did the, the way that the machine talks to the card is sufficiently simple that you can go out and buy $2 Java cards that you can program to imitate the official cards. And then as many times as you can insert the card, you can vote. So vote early, vote often. <laughs> Likewise, one of the things that the administrator cards can do is tell the machine that the election is over. So imagine that you have a precinct that happens to lean very heavily in favor of somebody you don't like. So you and all your buddies show up there at, at right before the lunch break when everybody's going to show up and vote. And everybody walks up to a machine, inserts their special administrator card, and tells the machine that the election is over, and then leaves. Now, by the time that the next voter gets up and says, it's not working, by the time they figure out what's going on and get the machines working again, it, lunch hour is over, and all those voters had to go back to work, and congratulations, you've successfully disenfranchised an entire group of voters. Now, these machines use cryptography as a way of protecting the voting data on its way from the voting machine to home base. Now, cryptography, that you could do that for, for um, messages that get sent over a modem, or you can use it for the actual memory cards. These are similar to the memory cards in your digital camera. Whether it goes, whether it's a hand-carried message or whether it goes over the telephone line, cryptography can do several things. Cryptography could keep the message secret, so even if somebody intercepts it, they can't make any sense of it. Cryptography could also potentially help you detect tampering. If somebody messed with the message, cryptography could give you proof that somebody had messed with the message. And then you might want to go back and figure out who did it and why. Well, what, this is the only line of computer code I'm going to show you today. What that code says is that every single Devold voting machine every manufact ever manufactured is using exactly the same cryptographic key. Imagine if every car in the parking lot used exactly the same ignition key. <laughs> and now you begin to understand the magnitude of the problem. When I was in high school, we figured out that my car key started a friend's car. We would move it around in the parking lot sometimes for fun. But you could imagine that you could do more damage to an election if you figured this one out. You could change any result. You know, if you can climb up on a telephone pole and hook alligator clips up, you can intercept and change anything and nobody, nobody will be the wiser. Now, Doug Jones, who is a member of Iowa's Board of Election Examiners and a professor at the University of Iowa, was talking to the vendor at a trade show in 1997 and said, so tell me how you do your key management, because keys are hard. It's the hard part of cryptography. How do you make sure every machine has a different key? How do you keep track of all the keys? They said, oh, we have a very simple solution. <laughs> and he said, how? And they said, this. And he said, you're nuts. So as far as we know, the bug is still there today, which is one way that you can measure how seriously they take their computer security. Now, the, the Diebold application is really just a C++ program about 50,000 lines long that runs on top of Windows CE. We can tell that there's some effort to prevent buffer overflows, which are the number one security flaw in C and C++. When you hear about somebody breaking into your Windows program, breaking into your Windows box, taking over your machine, turning it into a spam zombie, this is how they do it. So we know that Diebold made some effort to prevent this class of problems. But even in some of their public filings, they've admitted that they've had issues. But more deeply, we see things like if def Louisiana floating around their code. What does that mean? That means that they probably have to do a separate software build for each of the 50 states. And that means that they have a much more difficult time testing and validating and convincing themselves that they're shipping good software to each of the 50 states. In fact, Diebold has been caught red-handed shipping software versions to some states that were never certified at all. That's, so, so for what little the certification is worth, you know, just the poor design of their software directly leads to some of the problems that they've had later. So proper software engineering 101 says first you design it, then you build it. Now, you're not going to build a, a, a big bridge without somebody building a mock-up Maybe some people doing some math to figure out that the bridge won't fall down when you put cars on it. Well, Diebold, as far as we can tell, built it first and then documented it later. 
I'm a professor, I teach computer science, I require my students to do this, and you can tell when the students haven't done their documentation because when you do it right, you see evidence of the documentation throughout the code. You see them quoting chapter and verse. We're doing this weird thing because, it's, because it'll make it consistent with the design documents. We saw no evidence of that. We saw, in general, a, whole, a lack of citation to authority. We saw, we even saw evidence that they don't keep track of their own bugs properly. I worked at Netscape for two summers, and I can tell you that they have an elaborate bug tracking system, and they had plenty of bugs. And throughout their source code, you'll see a comment that says, we fixed this to, 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 to solve bug number, five digit number. There are no references like that anywhere in the Diebold source code which directly implies that they don't have a good bug management process. This is not the way you build code that has to work. This is not the way you build code to fly a space shuttle or an airplane. This isn't the way you build code to run a medical device that's keeping you alive while the surgeons are doing their thing. This isn't even up to the standards that Nevada requires for slot machines. <laughs> our slot machines are better regulated than our voting machines. So, it's no exaggeration to say that our democracy is depending on our voting machines. And our election officials are depending on the independent testing authorities. The, our election officials are very smart, hardworking people, but they're not computer scientists. And they're counting on other people having done this detailed analysis before they ever buy the machine. Well. The Diebold machine passed all of those tests with flying colors, but nonetheless, it has glaring, amazing flaws. Well, if the Diebold machine passed all the tests and has the flaws, what does that say about every other voting machine in use? Perhaps the testing is inadequate, and that raises interesting questions about every other machine that still have yet to be sufficiently answered. Now, you'd think that the people building these voting machines care very deeply about security and are working diligently to improve the situation. In fact, at a recent trade show where they were showing off their new toys, I'm told the big buzz was wireless networking in the polling place. Wireless networking is great. You can avoid having to have these cables duct taped to the floor to keep people from tripping over them. Easy to set up, easy to tear down, and easy for somebody to break into. You can sit in your car across the street with your Pringles can antenna, and you can be a part of that network. <laughs> so, since we published our paper about a year and a half ago, there have been several independent studies that have confirmed all of our findings. Again, science, science at work. So it's, don't take my word for it. It's, it's the whole, this is the consensus of the computer science community. And California, Nevada, and several other states are now requiring that you know, Nevada is, you know, did it for um, their biggest county, the one that has Las Vegas in it, for their, for, you know, just, just last week in their um, primary election and will be using it in their election this November. California is requiring it by 05 or 06. Some other states are looking at similar bills, not Texas. There is a bill pending in the Congress that's stuck in committee that would make it a national requirement. Unlikely that that's gonna make it out of committee. And as an interesting side note, the US military was looking at using internet voting so that way soldiers overseas could cast votes over the internet. Apparently mail-in votes, the mail doesn't work so well to you know, Fallujah, Iraq. There are some issues with that. You know, not all the mail gets through apparently. So they'd love to be able to have soldiers vote over the internet. So, but the military, to their credit, hired a bunch of really smart computer scientists and said, please evaluate the system. And they wrote a report that said, it's a disaster, it'll never work. And the military, amazingly enough, canceled the project. Amazing, they listened to the experts. Well, we're not seeing that same kind of attention to the experts in states like Texas and other states around the country. Well, what, so that might make some of you ask the question, what can I do? So I'll, I'll, I will quote the environmentalists. Think globally, act locally. Every state is different and every county is different. So you need to pay attention to your specific county and how they do what they do. 
get co ask for copies of their policies and procedure manuals. Their, their training manuals for poll workers. Heck, become a poll worker. You get involved. And when you, when you examine these things, worry about where are the machines stored. For early voting in Texas, that's like about two weeks long, where do the machines go at night? I was assuming that they were stored in your high school cafeteria, maybe locked in a closet, when I gave this talk to a local group. And somebody said, oh no, we don't do that. Well, what do you do? We take them home with us. <laughs> so I, don't, I, I hope that, that, that they're fixing that problem. Because if you can take it home with you, with your garage full of tools, there's no end of the mischief that you can do. And last, but certainly not least, the most important thing you can do is vote. If you stay at, if, if you have this attitude of, oh, my vote's not going to count anyway, why should I bother voting? If you don't vote, you guarantee your vote isn't counted. Whereas it's entirely possible that these machines could work. <laughs> so give your vote a chance. Something else you might ask your county clerk or secretary of state is why don't you follow the recommendations in the leadership, actually, conference on civil rights and Brennan Center report, a very long and detailed report that you can read for yourself at civilrights.org that goes into exhaustive detail about what you can do between now and November of 2004 to take your current DRE systems and make the best of a bad situation. There are advice you should have, you should put together an independent expert advisory board, you should they have advice on how to improve policies and procedures. They, they talk about how you might do parallel testing, where you pull some machines out of the pot and run a parallel election on those machines, where instead of normal voters, you have trained people voting from a script. So at the end of the day, it had better add up the way the script was, was generated. And that, that's, it, still won't it still won't catch all possible forms of fraud but it's a whole lot better than the logic and accuracy testing we do today. Just two days ago, a group of local concerned citizens invited me along for the ride, and they went and talked to our, the Harris County Commissioner, Beverly Kaufman, and they said, we, we say you should do this. And she said, no, more or less. So that's our esteemed election officials taking security seriously. So in conclusion, the current generation of paperless electronic voting systems are simply unacceptable. The arguments that we hear that, that, you, that you should trust us, but we're not going to let you investigate for yourself, we call that security through obscurity, is simply fallacious. And time and again, it has been shown that keeping a system secret doesn't improve its security. A system should be secure despite the fact that the bad guy knows everything there is to know about it, because the bad guy probably does. You need to give the good guys a fighting chance. And the certification, at least as it is today, is completely meaningless. The best technology we have today, precinct-based optical scanners. High accuracy, low cost, and they're transparent. So when your election official tells you, our next, ele our next election this November is going to work great, trust me, the question you should ask is, how do you know? And the answer is, they probably don't. Thank you. So, um, some places where you can find more, more information on your screen. So why don't we, uh, sort of in order, it's about five minutes each, is that, okay? Maybe six. <laughs> and, and I'll, do, I'll, I'll take four <laughs> and, and, and save the one. You want me to start? Yeah, you can start. Starting this side. Well, Dan, you've gotten funnier since spring. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, I'm going to start by saying, and I have a habit, I'm a, a rice trained engineer, so I have a, a habit of starting with the premises and working to my conclusions and my media advisor has been beating me over the head not to do that. So I'll start with the conclusion and, and then work backwards. Um, I absolutely agree that we should not have electronic machines that have no 
uh, that have no secondary record. Uh, the reason I believe that is I took political science here from Doc Cuthbertson, and and if you if anybody's taking political science here from Doc Cuthbertson, you know that there's three words you have to learn: myth, power, and value. Myth, power, and value. And, <laughs> And, and the words are myth, power, and value. And uh, as best I, since that was all I had to learn to pass the final, as best <laughs> as best I as I can remember, um, the 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 real key to that is that for a system, a political system, be, to be viable, there has to be a myth that people believe in. And we have to believe for our election systems to be viable. We have to believe they work. Now the truth is they haven't worked to scientific accuracy for a long time, uh, for a lot of reasons. My, uh, my good friend who, you know, elections are essentially a volunteer mm -hmm. operation. I have a good friend who, uh, under the punch card system, very carefully banded up 300 punch card ballots and set them on the gym stage because she was through with those and went through a whole bunch of others, took them in, and the next morning the janitor found 300 punch card ballots mm -hmm. on the gym stage could have easily not found those ballots or somebody could have taken something and rammed them right through. So we've always had problems and the question is how do you spend your money effectively to get rid of those problems? And I think we jumped off a cliff before we really knew what we were doing. And in fairness to my colleagues and uh, uh, Deborah Danberg, who many of you know, chaired the elections committee here uh, in the state, for the state of Texas when these decisions were being made. And as Deborah tells it, she begged and pleaded for there to be a Dan Wallach who would come out of somewhere, but we were on a, we were heck bent to get this thing done, and at the time, there wasn't a lot of opposition. Um, so now we've got the problem that we spent a lot of money on this stuff, and at least as of last spring, there really wasn't, there were theoretical alternatives, there really weren't viable alternatives. I couldn't have voted to replace it with something because there was no something and just very mm -hmm. vague estimates of cost. We're closer, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I'm real interested to see what happens in, in uh, Nevada. Uh, if I had a magic wand and if everybody still had uh, OpScan machines sitting in the back room, I would be tempted to demand that they drag them out and put them out and use them for this election. But uh, we didn't have OpScan to begin with here. We had punch cards. And I learned about hanging chads back when an election up in your part of the state was overturned long before the Florida situation, and I've been a religious chad peeler uh, ever since <laughs> off the back of ballots. <laughs> Hollerith cards were never, were never designed to be accurate down to the last vote either, no. and uh, you could run them through a hundred times. And anybody in here who's old enough to remember having to write computer programs on punch cards knows how much of a disaster that was. Um, I was having a discussion with, with uh, I got one minute, good. Uh, <laughs> I was having a discussion with Dr. Mattiso the other day about something completely different and, and he said this, 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 and this is awful and it's terrible. I said yes it is, but what do we replace it with? And we're, I think we're closer to answering this question than we were the question we were discussing, Professor. Um, but uh, uh, people have to have confidence in the elections and we have to get there. And sometimes the electronic solution isn't the best solution. And it's real whiz-bang and a lot of people like to, like to buy it and it's easy to sell because it's, it's new and modern. But I program computers for a living now uh, when I'm not being a legislator. And I know that no matter what my best intentions are and no matter how, how much I test it, um, you still don't find the mistakes until it gets out in the field. And the problem with this is when there's a mistake out in the field, you don't know it's a mistake. And at least half of the people involved in the system would rather that you not know it was a mistake and are not interested in finding that it's a mistake once the mistake's been made. So I appreciate your work and I'll pass the ball on to our clerk. Okay. Uh, my name is Dana DeBevois. I'm the Travis County Clerk. Um, I've been on this similar debate panel many times and so Dr. Wallach and I have gotten to be um, good friends over the last year or so and he is an engaging and intelligent um, uh, professional in his field. I've been conducting elections for 18 years. I've been in multiple countries. I've been bombed. I've been shot at. I've had tanks pulled up in front of my offices. Um, and fortunately, that wasn't at home. Uh, the, uh, the worst thing that ever happened to me at home was, you know, angry candidates or a recount that went badly and somebody was in tears or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but my attitude towards elections, because of my experience, is, number one, if voters can you know, find a creative way to mark a ballot, they will do so. 
And the second is Murphy's Law, if something can go wrong, it will. So my attitude is always back up, back up, back up, back up. Whatever, you've, whatever system you're operating, and I have conducted elections with lever machines, punch card machines for many years and was horrified, quite frankly, and insisted that they start replacing it. Uh, precinct ballot counter, uh, optical scan and optical scan central count, and three different kinds of DRE systems. So my background. So I'm the I'm the um, election official that usually gets the eggs and the tomatoes thrown. So I'm I'm hoping there's none here tonight. Uh, you know what on earth do you think you're doing, and how do you know you know this is going to be okay? And my answer to that is uh, maybe I don't. Maybe I don't, because one of the things that I did when we first started um, looking at voting systems to purchase was I, I, I got together a committee of experts, and I was fortunate to find a computer, a computer security specialist from Tivoli Systems to advise me when we went in and very carefully tore apart each one of these voting systems. And the, the criticism I would have with Dr. Wallach's approach is that he talks about Diebold and paints a broad brush as if all of these systems were the same and they are not. What I found when I did my analysis is I actually agree with Dr. Wallach about the Diebold system. He, he found exactly what I found when I did my analysis. That's why I didn't buy it. And you don't have that system here in Harris County and we don't have it in Travis County for the reasons he has pointed out. Now, we can, I do think that we, there was a tendency to rush, this whole thing has been driven by the Americans with Disabilities Act, okay? And I do think there has been a, a, a push to do this where perhaps we need to drop back and think about, let's think about our testing and our security. So quickly, let, let, me, let me just kind of try to sum this up for you. What is election security really? Well, I'm gonna say something provocative to you. Election security is not the voter. Election security is something that is, that is tested and rock solid and done professionally and in an engineering and scientific manner prior to deployment. It is not something that you wait until it long, long into the end of the day and you're expecting a voter to tell you, oh, by the way, there's a problem. No, 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 no. We, my responsibility to all of you voters would be to make darn sure it was correct before it went out the door. So how can we do that? Well, um, I don't think, I think the leap, if we're going to make another leap, it shouldn't be to vote a verified paper ballot. Let the engineers and the EAC play out their role, carefully considering this, and let, let's not make a second leap. That may turn out to be a great idea, and we'll warmly embrace it once we decide that. But for now, what can we do for now? And I'm, and I'm glad this is the focus. Here's what I'm doing in Travis County. I suspect other counties are doing the same thing. I'm not that unique. Here's what I'm doing. First of all, um, y y let's make sure you've got actual physical security. Are your locks working? Did you lock up that night? Have you got an alarm? Do you know where stuff is? Do you have segregation of duties? Do you always have more than two people doing a particular job and those two same people are not doing the job that's going to be connected to the next job? And did you do criminal background checks on those, people's, uh, on those people? I'm doing that. I believe that the gold standard for testing the software to make sure that you've got the correct software and only that version and nothing else resident in there, no bugs, no problems, no Trojan horses, is hash code testing. Give me a show of hands in the room of the people who say, when I say hash code testing, you know what I'm talking about. Thank you. Good. Okay. Y'all can help explain it to your, to your friends. That will be the biggest thing that we can do, and I'm hoping we can do it for November. The second thing is parallel testing. I'm going to be doing it for November. Now, the concept is at the last minute you go out and pull some equipment that was destined for the field, and you set it up under a controlled environment videotape. You vote a known deck of, of, of ballots on it, and then you can check it out at the end to see if it behaved the way in a real-life environment that it had behaved in a test environment. Finally, a citizens' oversight committee. Get together. We're going to get, get together. In fact, that's already been established in Travis. We have a, a group of concerned citizens, technical people, political folks, and my customers who are going to watch over my shoulder at every important little really critical point in the, in the process, and they're going to be really sorry about how much time I'm going to take of theirs, um, watching all of the things that are important for us to do, like how do you know when I'm, when I'm sending equipment out into the field that that particular piece went to that particular place and can I trace it back? So in other words, inventory control, the actual ballot lockdown, you know, all of those detailed procedures behind the scenes, we will be doing that. There should be more focus on training. Um, when we talk about logic and accuracy testing, the, 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 go, the previous procedures for logic and accuracy testing failed in two ways. One, you have to do proofing first. If you're only testing logic and accuracy, on an aired model, then all you'll do is replicate the error again. So first you have to make sure you're correct, 
then you do your logic and accuracy testing at a sufficient volume. I'm working real fast. So to make sure that you've got a correct system that will work down to the precinct level. And then finally, and that that logic and accuracy testing must be done manually. And then finally, you have to go through a process of analysis of risk assessment. What my security engineers taught me is what you're going to find in this document that I've handed out for you. The, the risk assessment that you do depends on the specific area. So what you do, and this is what I'm teaching county clerks around the state, is you go through and you look at all the specific areas of your operation. What could go wrong with this particular area? What might I do to mitigate it? What might I do to back up? How much will it cost? Who will be in charge of it? And on your second page, what you're going to see is the concept of roles and permissions, people who work in the election system. How trusted are they and how much access do they have and do, are they password coded and can you control that? Who are the outside parties? And most importantly, we're going to have to learn, as, as Dr. Wallach um, talked about documentation, Elections administrators are going to have to do a better job of documentation, and that, that, I think, can be on the basis of rules of evidence. The rules of evidence say you have to have something physical, you have to, have, you have to know who created it, some kind of a personal mark, and you have to have some sort of evidence locker to lock it up. That's the attitude of election officials today. <laughs> In five minutes, it's hard to rebut 45 minutes of <laughs> a lot of information, and this has, by the way, been a two-year conversation. Thank you. <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> Dana, I think I need a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Tony Cervello. I'm currently serving uh, as the executive director of, it's a long name, International Association of Clerks for Carters, Election Officials, and Treasurers. It's an international group containing at least five or 600 election officials. As such, as an organization, I can't speak for everyone in the organization because we have members from all 50 states and, and different of our members have different opinions as to whether or not their voting system is secure. Uh, I made some notes while Dan was, it's always uh, interesting to listen to uh, Dan. We, we were on a program last week for the League of Women Voters and in fact, that's what he said to me. He said, now I came to your program, now you can come to mine, but I wanna, I wanna make one little, and it's very hard to correct the way you are organized. But at the beginning of your presentation, you said to the audience that after you talked about the problems with voting systems, you were going to offer uh, a way to fix them. We in the election business never used the word fix. <laughs> <laughs> when you deal with uh, the political parties, as I did for 29 years here as, as administrator of elections in Harris County, and I was here when we implemented the uh, DRE voting system here, you learn that anything you say can always be interpreted to favor one party or the other. After Florida, uh, and, and I think that's what a lot of this is based on, I'm not sure we would be talking about security of voting or the ability of the voter to get to the ballot if Florida hadn't happened. And let me tell you, all of us that did elections, and I did them for 29 years, I can tell you what the election administrator's mantra is. Please don't let there be any close races. <laughs> On election day, all of my friends said, you get to see the results before anyone else. And I said, I never look to see who's winning or losing. I only look at the right-hand side of the page to make sure everything is at least 55% or 45%. <laughs> because we know what's gonna be coming. Because no candidate ever lost an election, they just didn't get enough votes. But we, we, had, we had all the, the, the problems uh, after Florida. Every state could have, could have had the problems, is what I meant to say. I, I was inundated with media, I was inundated with media questions, et cetera, because in Texas, we had the same system, we had punch cards. We had hanging chads, and I had to address many of the same issues. And one of the things that I'm not sure, how many of you voted on our punch card system before the DRE system? How many of you ever read the cover of the punch card book before you voted? As opposed to, very good, as opposed to turning the page and beginning voting. Because if you had, you would have seen that instruction number three said, before depositing your punch card ballot in the ballot can, please check the back of your ballot to be sure that all the holes are punched through. And if every voter had done that in Florida, 
we wouldn't have had that situation in Florida. Now, we can't remedy what happened with the butterfly ballot. I personally would have never done that in Harris County, and I feel sorry for the lady that did that. And by the way, she just lost the Florida primary two weeks ago, so she's no longer an uh, election supervisor. People do have long memories. But, but seriously, it's, it's an issue that is very troubling to election officials today as to what are you going to do. That's why there has been like a stoppage on purchasing of DRE voting systems in, in the last year. Many of my friends throughout the country, after we moved in Harris County, uh, and we were like second to Riverside County, California, because as, uh, as Scott was saying, this problem was not evident at the time that we bought the voting system in Harris County. A lot of jurisdictions are taking a wait and see approach now. And a lot of the vendors are hurting for this because they're not making any sales. I'm surprised no one has offered you a job, Dan. They figured if they got you in their camp, it might help their sales some, but I'm sure you wouldn't take the job anyway. No one's offered. No one's offered. <laughs> but you know, there, there, there is no perfect voting system. You're going to have to adapt to whatever you can. I know that Dan likes the optical scan system very much. I dealt with four voting systems in Harris County. The old lever machines, punch cards, optical scan for voting by mail, and the DRE electronic system for election day. And let me tell you on the optical scan systems voting by mail, as Dana said, you can't imagine what voters would come up with. The instructions are to fill in the square, but they don't do that. Some of them circle a candidate. Some of them scratch out every one but the one they want to vote for. <laughs> you have to determine voter intent, and that's a difficult thing to do. I didn't like doing that with punch cards. I didn't like to be the person that had to hold that up and say, that hole is partially punched through. Did that voter not push hard enough, or did the voter change his or her mind halfway through? I don't want to have to make that decision. So I don't know where we're going. I can tell you that the Election Assistance Commission, which was formed by the Help America Vote Act, got a late start because of funding, federal funding, but they are working very diligently to try to address a lot of these issues. They can't do it in time for this November, and they don't have regulatory authority, but Dana is on the Standards Board, and I'm on the Board of Advisors, and for the first time, the federal government is listening to people who've actually conducted an election and I think that's progress, if nothing else is. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Mitchell, and I'm here from Consumers Union. And you might wonder what Consumers Union has to do with voting machines. Uh, we're the publisher of Consumer Reports magazine. And I am uh, somebody who works primarily on open government issues because as a um, as a group who works on consumer product issues across the country, we are constantly finding that government holds information that consumers want to know and they're not giving it to us. And so we find that we get ourselves into a lot of debates and discussion about access to government information. And this issue came to my attention because, well, some people brought it to me. Um, we don't take a position on voting machines. But we do take a position on the process. And the thing that I'm here to talk about is that there's a fundamental problem in the process of developing, of, of making voting machine certification decisions. And that is that it's fundamentally all a big, deep, deep dark secret. And in this state in particular, we have a long history of doing our government processes in public. We believe, and we have believed for decades, that the more people who are engaged in the process, be they experts or citizens or just people who took an interest one day, the better process you have and the better product you have at the end of the day. What we found, and I'm, I'm here to sort of fill in the gap, I guess, a little bit between uh, the, the representative, who's correct, that uh, you know some legislation passed two years ago, there wasn't a lot of information at that time. Well, why wasn't there a lot of information at that time? That was because it's a trade secret. We have put our election process in the hands of private corporations who have a trade secret interest in the structure of the product that they are selling to government and the public. If you go into a voting machine and you use something like this, 
This may or may not be a patented pen, but it's fundamentally not a trade secret how it works. You, you know, you turn it this way, you plunk, you know, you plunk the thing, the ink comes out the end, and everybody understands what the system is. If you build an electronic voting machine under our current system, the supplier, the vendor, has a statutory rule in, you know, in our Texas statute that says that that code is a deep dark secret and nobody gets to see it. That little nugget of code, that little statutory line right there has created a sort of a, you know, waterfall of secrecy around this process. We got involved because in between the uh, certifying agencies that were described in this uh, presentation and the counties who have to purchase a product, there is a state certification process. That state certification process involves uh, several individuals who've been reviewing voting machines for many, many years, largely the same group of people. They meet three times a year. The vendor is the only person who's present at those meetings. They discuss with each other the product. They actually run, you know, they, they run a little test ballot or they test whatever uh, feature of the product is before them at that time. They discuss among themselves issues that might come up and then they have an opinion. They transmit their opinion to the Secretary of State and that process results in certification of those machines for use in Texas. This is a rather unusual system. Texas has a lot of such advisory committees. Agencies and, and head honchos of governmental bodies want to have the advice and counsel of experts. That's rational and they should. In most cases, those kind of bodies meet in public and they review documents that the public can review. They get commentary from Competitors in the industry, for example, who have an interest in showing the flaws of their competitor's product. They get commentary from the general public. Oh, here's someone's telling me I only have a minute. Uh, we got into the fight basically to say that this group shouldn't be meeting in secret, that these are issues that a lot of people have an interest in and that the process would be better if they met in public. Uh, the after we got involved and we got involved through the attorney general process, um, the ACLU sued over the process, the secrecy issues, and they stopped meeting. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it didn't. Clearly it doesn't solve the problem. Uh, we have to assume that somebody thinks that Texas needs to review the machines and just not meeting anymore isn't the solution. That has created, you know, now it's even more secret than it was before. Um, that was certainly, I'm sure, not the intent of the people who filed that lawsuit. Um, and I hope that we're going to be moving into a time when we can have a different process as well as a different product. their responses. We'll open up to questions, but I know it was a tough challenge to keep you five minutes after having done well XP for 40 minutes. <laughs> so anyway, let's open for questions. Uh, okay. um, Tony, I think you really ought to look at that Florida election again. Uh, the idea that the only thing wrong with that was people didn't check their chads is ludicrous. There were butterfly ballots that confused people. There were 50,000 African Americans that were wrongly struck the rules for being felons and they weren't. Uh, there was a 16,000 negative vote in Volusia County that nobody can explain even to this day. Um, there were differential rates of throwing ballots out between black counties and white counties based on uh, apparently what the election official decided was a stray mark. I mean, there's things as long as you're armed that were wrong with that election. But that's not my question. Uh, my question is, uh, Dana, would you go through the, when you talk about uh, trusted parties, would you go through all the different kinds of people, starting at Partner Civic, the people that work for them, starting with your 
protect uh, temporaries and all, and, and talk about all the different people that have access to your machines. Okay. Um, first of all, let me refer you to the front page of your handout. The concept here is that the election is a bubble. Okay, this, this is a perimeter around here. And the gray area represents the, the inside workings, of the amoeba, basically. So what you want to have is any time anything penetrates that membrane, that's a checkpoint. That's where you want to have controls. It could be a vendor. It could be the sheriff. It could be a voter. It could be me. It could, in other words, but at any point in time when we come into this process, you want to have a set of controls that's specific to that person. Now, let me give you some examples of the kinds of things. First of all, I believe in vendor independence. And so while I do accept um, some uh, advice and some, uh, uh, you know, version control training and, you know, stuff like that from my vendor, I actually operate the system myself. Uh, my people do that. So, and I, I do believe in vendor independence, and it is not a thing that's easy to accomplish, and it does take a, a county several elections to get to that point, but that should always be your goal. That you, should, you should be operating without the vendor being, um, ha handling it, you know, certainly there to advise, but not handling the election. So, so vendor is one example of a trusted party. Now, the way I divide my staff is I've got um, a temporary, uh, well, oh, let me start at the top. I have an elections division manager and an assistant manager, and they have the highest level of passwords, okay? Those are the folks that actually have control over ballot definition. Now, let me bust one of the other pieces of misinformation that's out there. I don't have the software code. I don't, I don't have it. So I can't change it. I don't, it it's, a, it's in escrow with the Secretary of State's office, but what's on my machine is only uh, basically the equivalent of an Excel spreadsheet. All I do is ballot definition. I do no programming. But those two people have access to ballot programming, okay? Then I have another, and I have no access code whatsoever. None. I, I couldn't get into the system to do it. Segregation of duties. Then I have another layer of people that come in and check that, and that is a partly public group and a partly my employee group that come in and do those checking. And the checking that they do is in multiple layers. Um, because once, as I said once before, you have to start with proofing. So I've got a citizen, and, and these people tend to be return people, so they're not just somebody I plucked off the street. It, they, they're wise, and they're trained, and they're, they're smart, and they know what they're doing. Okay? Um, then I've got another layer of folks that are what I call my troubleshooters. What troubleshooters have is they, they usually have a, a level of engineering and computer science background, and then what I have done is take their technical background and apply it to the elections environment. So they become educated not only in the equipment and how to do repairs and how to do troubleshooting, okay, which also involves a bit of training element to, to teach election judges what to do. But they also understand the processes by which a voter is qualified, by which they might be disqualified, how the votes are you know, captured. They, they understand that entire process. And what you have, what I do with them is I put them out in a, in a district kind of an assignment uh, during early voting and election day with assigned precincts that they go to, and they travel around in vans that are loaded with extra equipment, extra cables, tools, supplies, tra extra training manuals, whatever, you know, <coughs> tissues if somebody gets their feelings hurt. I mean, you know, whatever, they take care of the folks who are actually operating the polling places. Then the layer before, below that is the early voting workers, and we have folks who are, there's at least three layers of those folks at the early voting level. You have a presiding judge, an alternate judge, and then workers, and you must have a mix of parties, Democrat, Republican, Green, Libertarian, all of them, in those polling places working at all times, okay? Then you go through certain balancing procedures at the end of every day to make sure that what votes that you're counted uh, match up with what's resident on the machine. So there are audits that they also are responsible for conducting too. Then you have the layer of folks who are working in, uh, in my counting station on election night or the receiving substations who are checking materials. They're uh, uh, probably ne the next to the lowest level in terms of access. Really all they can do is accept official surrender and make those personal marks when they're collecting evidence. Okay, so they're, they're your evidence collectors. Uh, the sheriff is, I rank them at about a third level of enrolls and permissions because what you want to have is some third party that takes possession of the ballot box during early voting every night, right? Not me and not my staff and not the parties, right? But this third law enforcement agency, they actually go pick up the box in a law enforcement vehicle, 
take it, lock it up in a vault, and then they open it up the next morning and deliver it back out. So law enforcement has access to the ballot box, but they don't have any way to get into it. They, you know, it's sealed and they don't have a code to get into it. So they don't have any passwords, but they have access to it. Okay. I feel like I'm rambling here a little bit. Um, and then there's poll watchers. They have the absolute ability to come in and see you warts and all, watch everything you're doing, reveal every mistake. Um, I've grown very comfortable over the years of having to get on television and say, well, you know, so-and-so made this mistake, so-and-so made this mistake, and, you know, we'll, we'll work on um, this in our training program for next time. And, and, you know, there are, and as a result of that, you, you get continuous improvement and you get people who've learned from their mistakes. But there's always silly things that happen. <clears throat> I had this one problem the first time I used, the, or second time I used the um, electronic voting system, and this was the final one we'd settled on. I'd used two other systems prior to that. So this is now our fourth time to use it. And I got a call from one of the judges one day, and they said, you know, all of our machines are just turning off on us. They're just turning off. We don't know what's wrong. So we sent troubleshooters out there. Well, what had happened was just that all their machines had been operating on battery backup all day. And by the end of the third day, three days on battery backup, by the end of the third day, what we realized with the judge was that the judge had never flipped the switch on the surge, the little plug-in surge protector. <laughs> so they ruined a bunch of batteries and freaked a bunch of people out when really all it was was a human error because they tripped the switch and once we tripped the switch, everything came back up and it was perfectly fine. So it's stuff like that you have to deal with. Um, have I, does that answer your question about how you break it down? Yeah, I'm just trying, uh, you know, Machines break and Absolutely. people are, are sometimes in error and they're sometimes... Absolutely. Uh, and so what you tell Sometimes they're crooked and it's, you know, you have to... juggle both problems. Every... Uh, absolutely. And that's why I say I believe in backup, backup, backup. Um, the judges must attend a training class even though there's no state law right now that requires it. I, I just sort of force them to by sheer force. Just, I just say you have to. Uh, <laughs> I pay them for the class time. Um, I, I have, you know, the mix of Democrats and Republicans and whatnot, you know, throughout the whole system so that we're always watching over each other. And, and I've also been responsible, for, I'm, a, I'm a Democrat, I'm an elected Democrat, but I've been responsible for conducting the Republican primary now for the last 16 years. So I, I think it's that transparency that helps too, so that when, when we have errors, which refers to Tony's comment about there's no such thing as perfection in elections, there's no such thing as a perfect world, when you have errors, Let's make sure we all open it up and we can see, you know, what it was, who did it, how it happened, you know, and make apologies and then prepare to not make that mistake again. And if I can respond to your comment about Florida, yeah, I, 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 I'm very well aware of there were other problems. I was trying to limit my comments to strictly the voting systems, but if you have read the Help America Vote Act, uh, there were several bills introduced in Congress after the Florida election fact over over a hundred and this bill was the one that finally came about and it was a you know bipartisan effort. In this bill there are many, many provisions that address the other problems in Florida other than punch card voting. For instance, this year for the first time in Harris County, uh, we used it in the primary, we have such a low turnout in Harris County, it wasn't noticeable, but you will notice that this November uh, we will be using provisional ballots for the first time as opposed to challenge ballots. Previously, under a challenge ballot, an election official had the authority to turn you away from the polls if you couldn't prove to him or her that you were registered to vote. Under the federal law now, uh, when there's a federal office on the ballot, which obviously there is this November, every voter must be allowed to vote a provisional ballot, meaning that that ballot is not counted up front. There's a period of time after election day, what, eight days? I think it is. Eight days to research. Eight days that a, you can research the voters' qualifications for voting and then you count the ballot after the fact. So that's one thing. There's also a requirement for a statewide voter registration system, 2006, that that goes into effect so that it can eliminate voters perhaps uh, not knowing whether or not they're in the right county or not. So it's a very complex piece of legislation and it did try to address uh, all of the situations that happened in Florida, but uh, Dana and I just attended an election meeting in Washington, D.C. two weeks ago, and everyone is concerned about what will be the Florida of 2004 because it looks like this could be another close election. Yeah. And just so we don't have to worry in Texas, the, the, the winners right now are Ohio and, and Missouri, not, not Texas. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a question for the Honorable Scott. I, Hopper? Close enough. Okay. 
Um, you mentioned something about there was a time and day, but it hasn't been in a long time since we could really rely on a voting system. Were you, were you referring to the lever system? Or what's I'm this sorry, I, I, don't, I don't remember exactly the remark. So, so. It was almost like you alluded to, like we did at one point in this country have something that, that we could really count on, that we were... No, I, I don't, no. I, we really I, never I, have. If I, said, if I said that, I don't mean to imply that. Um, well, I'm there are there are all of the problems that the, the woman up there mentioned, and one of the comments that I was going to make was that I, you know, the this is sort of a good geek issue, and you know, it's 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 motivated a lot of folks who probably didn't think much about elections before. I'm not looking at you for any particular reason, <laughs> <laughs> but your dad says he, but your dad always voted. I know that, but but there are a tremendous number of places, and nobody up here I think will deny this, where where the opportunity for either disenfranchising voters or, or having um, an incorrect intent expressed all the way through the system. I mean, I had in my very small primary election in, in the spring where there were not more than 1,500 votes cast, if that many, um, I, it was alleged that there was voter fraud going on and it was a very interesting system for how they did it and the only reason anybody caught on to it is that somebody told. Um, and you know, and, and and one of the reasons I think people are nervous this year is that all these wonderful new things from the Help America Vote Act, a lot of them are untested. And so we have we have uh, you know we have a, a new registration system in the state. People are going to be asked for IDs, and they may not know that they're going to be asked for IDs. And I'm not even sure whether that's picture ID or an ID with your correct address or what happens if you show up with a driver's license with the wrong address on it. Yeah. Anyway. Well, I'm hearing two different things, that there's something within well, I'm the... Well, politician, so you shouldn't... <laughs> <laughs> there's something with... A, there's flaws within the actual system, be it electronic or lever, and then there's flaws with actually the uh, human system that's running this whole operation. Absolutely. And but a lot, of the, a lot focus... of the challenges... A lot of the challenges in correcting the flaws with an electronic voting, uh, voting machine, for instance are based on the fact that you don't have regular paid staff practiced out there every day. You have a huge number of volunteers, and I don't know how it is in the educated Travis County, <laughs> but, in, but, in, but in Harris County, I mean, they are begging people down to the last minute to get people just to come in and be warm bodies to run these elections. So when you start talking about, well, what happens when the, the paper doesn't match, if it was if it was the people on this at this table running it every day in and day out, it'd be great. It'd be it'd be fine, but when you have volunteers doing it, we don't. There's not a lot of assurance that if they find a problem, that the correct thing will get done with the problem. But if we remove the human factor out of the equation, just focus on the internal system, um, is that lever system not maybe perhaps better than any sort of electronic system? Well, it, it is I mean, until you... That sounds bizarre, except but that the, Except that the county, the and Tony has more experience in this than I, but the county could um, generally support the cost of its election by selling the scrap metal that was found in the bottom of any one of those lever machines <laughs> that at the end. Broke? Yeah, I mean, they broke, they were hard to maintain, and nobody thought about it. I mean, what happens if a gear breaks? I mean, no, do, do, do the votes get recorded? <laughs> and you have the same exact issue. I mean, my concern, frankly, is not, I'm not as worried about that, other than the fact that he's told every Rice student how to break into a machine. <laughs> I, am not, I, am not, I am not as worried about voter fraud as I am just the darn thing fails and nobody knows it. And I know that, you know, uh, Richard Murray has told me I'm going to win my election this fall, but if I don't, <laughs> if I don't, I'm, and, and if I get bizarre results out of one precinct, I'm going to be suspicious. Well, the truth is there's always bizarre results out of precincts. There are always election results that you don't expect. But now we're going to have somebody to point to and say, ah, the machine did it. And that's why I'm worried about the, the people's faith in the system. Well, I have one last comment for Dan. I really appreciate the work you're doing. And I really agree with the idea of some sort of a receipt by paper from the electronic system and measuring that way. Well, just, we just have to make sure we don't call it a receipt. Because if it's a if it's a if it's a receipt that you can take with you, then then uh, Guido stands outside and makes sure that you vote. <laughs> yes. that, that, that's a serious issue. No, let me let me follow up with something Scott said about about the shoot voting machine. That's the system I used for the first twelve years I did elections in Harris County. And other than the fact that a few of them rolled off the truck and 
went rolling down the street, no one wanted to get in front of them to stop them, <laughs> or the fact that they messed up carpet and polling places and whatever. It took nine warehouses in Harris County to store them. The reason we got rid of shoot machines to begin with is it no longer held our ballot in Harris County. We have way too many contested races. There were only room for 50. However, I did many, many, many recounts on shoot voting machines. And the way you did a recount on a shoot voting machine or a mechanical lever machine was you went to the back of the machine and you turned a gear that opened up what was called a private counter. And the private counter were the votes that were recorded for each candidate. Now, how did those votes get, get recorded? When you went into the mechanical machine, you turned a red knob, which closed the curtain. You then went down the list and turned another knob, which put an X next to the candidate's name of your choice. And then when you finished voting, you turned the red knob again, and the X's went up. And on the back of the machine was a little totalizator, similar to what a lot of people use in grocery stores when they're marking it like that. And it was supposed to add one to that candidate's name. Can I tell you that I went into recounts where the vote for president was 75 to 50 and the vote for governor was 500 to 450? Do you think that people undervoted that much in the president's race? No. The machine broke in the middle of the day. And in that regard, the election official could not know that. There was no indication because the election official could not see. The only thing the election official saw during the day was the number of people who voted in that particular piece of equipment. There was no paper trail for that either. But again, that's why I say that Florida has triggered a lot of this discussion. Whether it's good or bad, it's got more people thinking about elections. I can tell you that, two because th I was still an election administrator then, and two things we said was, one, two things. One, everybody's going to understand now that you don't put an election together a week before election day, just like that. And secondly, maybe people will understand how much their vote really does matter, and they'll take it much more seriously. One question here, yes. and then one in the back. I just have one. Uh, I think, was your favorite system the op optical scan? Yes. Voting thing. And I think just really quick, one other question. Didn't the CEO of Diebel say that he would deliver Ohio to push? Or is, is that wrong? Yes. So I think okay. the exact when quote. Didn't just come out and say, I, you'll, don't yeah. worry, you'll yeah. get Ohio. The, the, the chairman of Diebel, Wally O'Dell, who was a Bush pioneer, I'm going to try to get this quote as right as I can. In a letter to Republican partisans, said that he wanted to do everything he could to help bring Ohio's votes to the, you know, and needless to say, he, he ate some crow over this remark. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, now the, the the board of directors of Diebold actually discovered some corporate responsibility and mandate that their officers no longer have any political involvement. And so I don't think he's he's as engaged today as he used to be. But nonetheless, it's a legitimate concern that somebody who clearly has a strong preference for one party might, in his executive capacity, you know, hire developers with a similar partisanship, and you know, it's, it's a legitimate concern. And you don't have to go that far, because because while I know you play on both sides and, yes, and, and are very partisan, I mean, I'm very nonpartisan. Our elections are run by partisan elected officials. And I won't ask you to tell me how you could do it, but, but I can imagine some ways that uh, voting machines broken in a certain part of a county could get faster response than voting machines broken in another. And there are, there are clearly ways that a partisan county clerk in Texas who wanted to slip things yeah. one direction or another without ever committing fraud Be unethical. could do it. And we, we've never even discussed that I know having you know having a, a, a Democratic and a Republican and excuse me to any third or fourth party aficionados out here um, <laughs> sitting both at the top of some kind of a commission. But, but clearly there there is always at least suspicions that there are games going on. There are also always suspicions that the person on your side is um, is not being partisan enough for fear right. <laughs> they're helping the other side too much. If you are caught in the middle, yes. But so you don't have to go all the way to that, to Diebold. To Actually, have Scott, that there was a bill introduced several years ago, I want to say maybe 17 or 18 years ago, that would allow someone who wanted to run for county clerk in the state of Texas to file for both parties. 
And then if that person won, I'm not sure which party they would choose. <laughs> but Scott, you know, the, what he says is very important. It, it's, it's one of the reasons that uh, in my position of administrator of elections in Harris County, I never voted in the party primary. There was no way I could convince both major political parties in Harris County that I was completely nonpartisan if I voted in one of their primaries or not. I didn't even vote whenever my boss ran and might have an opponent. <laughs> It, was the, it wasn't easy to tell her why I wasn't voting for her, but I felt it was my, it, it was my duty, and, and, and it, it took a while to convince both parties that they were going to get a fair shot in Harris County as long as I had anything to say about it. And that's not an easy thing to do. There are a lot, now, there are election administrators in Texas <coughs> that are appointed, and they do not hold a you know, party office. But you know, there's probably as many ways to... Uh, skin the cat as you can come up with, and some we probably haven't thought of. And, and for the record, and for the record, Tony did convince everybody. There was absolutely no question when Tony was elections administrator that the elections here were were run as fairly as humanly possible. Thank you. We have one question in the back. I think we can two, get two more questions after that, and we'll kind of need to wrap up. Hi, I have a question for Dan Wallach. Um, I'm a recent Rice graduate in electrical engineering and anthropology. Whenever I get to a room, I immediately look around and see who's at the lecture because it fascinates me. And in this room, you'll predominantly see Caucasians and well-educated Caucasians. Um, and one of the things that your lecture doesn't address, but something that I'm sure you're aware of as a computer scientist professor at Rice University, is that minorities, women and the elderly are not very familiar with technology by and large. I had to teach my mom how to use email. It's not intuitively obvious to her that she needs to close the X to close an application or she needs to push certain buttons for things to happen. And I've talked to people about how they feel about electronic voting like on the street, like, you know, just kind of out of curiosity. And a lot of people are kind of afraid to vote because they're afraid that they might be stupid, that they won't have anybody to ask questions in the booth, like no expert to troubleshoot for them. There, there's no way, there's no place they can go to get educated. There's no PBS program they could watch to show them how to use a touch screen. There are a lot of people that don't have access to technology, which sounds odd, but even in Harris County, they don't. What do you think could be done, and I mean, you, you say that this electronic technology could open it up for more people with disabilities, but I see it alienating more people than helping. Right. So the issue is, how can you build a system that is accessible? Now, accessible is a very broad term. That means that it's usable by people with disabilities, usable by people who, who don't speak English, usable by people who've never touched a computer before. The Brazilian system is an interesting design because they were, they were very much, perhaps even more, much more focused than the American systems are on usability. And they were focused on designing for illiterate voters, etc. That level of scrutiny is something that, I mean, it's a human factors problem. And we have people here at Rice who study human factors professionally. And it's, it's just, it's part of the engineering challenge of building a voting system. And I think that one of the benefits of applying pen to paper is despite the fact that some voters can't seem to follow the instruction, fill in the bubble with an arrow. Nonetheless, our, paper, our civilization has had paper for a couple thousand years. And I think people have pretty much figured it out by now. And you can have a nice schematic picture that shows a pen filling in a bubble, and people can figure out that schematic picture. Or at least enough of them figure it out that it seems to be accurate. I mean, this is, like we said, there's no perfect system. And percentage-wise, those accuracy numbers I had from the recall election in California show that the optical scan systems have, at least as best we can measure it, fairly good accuracy. So are they perfect? No. You know, the, are any other systems any better? Today, not yet. And I think that's a very important challenge. How do you engineer a better system that's accessible to the larger community? I think it's a terrific question. I don't like the e-slate. Because I am, you know, I'm 
I think pretty sophisticated. I have a double E degree from Rice, so I ought to be able to know how to work a voting machine. Um, and I am uncomfortable on any size ballot using Eastlake. Now, maybe it's just because I haven't used it much, but that's fine. I mean, if, that's, if that makes me uncomfortable, how does it make... How does it make the voter who is even less willing to play with new technology and gadgets? When we design software and you design the user interface, you give it your best shot, you test it, you have people look at it, and then you send it out there. And if people repeatedly screw up the same thing and are calling your helpline and saying, I can't make this work, well, you know, where's, where's the menu to do this? You say, hmm, better change that. But, but the problem with voting because of the security issue is you don't get the opportunity to go back to somebody later and say, okay, this is what, you, this is what we think you voted. Now, really, was this what you, what you thought you voted? If they're doing my software, it blows up, and they figure out right away they didn't do the right thing. We don't even know. So can, I think, can I just add, too, that um, there is always a burden on those of us who are conducting elections to uh, provide training and outreach. I, I've spent $1.5 million in a professional outreach program in Travis County using video tapes, uh, access television, you know, I mean, I can't even tell you, flyers in the utility bills, I mean, everything I can think of, you know, Speakers Bureau with the League of Women Voters, to try to reach all kinds of voters so that everybody does feel comfortable. We have demonstration units in the booth, but it doesn't matter. It, it, it's, it, what I'm trying to get to the point here is it doesn't matter what kind of voting system you have, you always have that challenge. Even, I mentioned to you, you would not believe how people mark optical scan ballots. It's unbelievable. Um, but, some really. are more, but some are more intuitive than others. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> to, to, Maybe you need to spend some time at a calculation. <laughs> no, I, I understand. I just had to write no, software. The, 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 the <laughs> point, though, is, is that the, there's always that burden there, no matter what system we have used in the past and no matter what systems we have used in the future. And one of the things that the EAC has recognized it is, is that those human factors, professionals, and I think we have, did you mention somebody over here as a human yeah. factors, that, that you, folks like you are going to be really important for the future, especially regarding elections, because they do need to be more intuitive. And so the next generation of systems you see are going to have this new level of um, development put into them. And, and right now it's, it, you know, they do it a little bit. It's going to get a whole lot more professional in the future. Well, and, and I mean, again, jumping out of the box, one of the things that we've talked about is we don't have professionals out there doing it, but we do have more professionals now doing it because we are doing early voting, and those tend to be the same people over and over and over. And so maybe one of the ways to attack a lot of these problems, maybe one of the problems is that we have, what, 900 and some voting precincts in Harris County, and maybe we don't need 900 and some voting precincts Thank in you. Harris County. Maybe we need... Maybe we need fewer places open longer or something like that. And, and that, again, I don't know that that's an answer, but it may make more sense for people to travel a little further and because the, the person who can't go anywhere can't get to the polling place anyway, to travel a little further and have more of a chance of at least having one person who is well-trained there than it does to have 900, than to try to fill 900 polling places all around the county. In, uh, in that same regard, the, the chairman uh, of the Election Assistance Commission has, uh, has instituted a program, and I don't know if he's gotten uh, too much positive response yet, but he has asked Corporate America to let employees off on Election Day and not have it count as a sick day or a vacation day or whatever, and have them be off at full pay and work at the polls on Election Day. And if we get a person like that, that person can be professionally trained to be counted on to work in every major election, not all the ones we have in Texas because we have a lot of elections that we probably wouldn't need all these people in. But nonetheless, if this comes about, it, that, that could make a very big difference in what Scott and Dana are saying now uh, about we may have people at the polls. That's the, that's the place where the marble always rolls. We can come up with every idea we think of, but if the if the election officials, the, the, the polling officials, are not doing their job correctly, it doesn't matter how much preparation we've done. We always have several polling places that just don't open on time and miss part of the morning rush. We're talking <laughs> about this, I mean, real simple things. How many people did we disenfranchise there? It's, it's just, there's just all kinds of problems. So we have, we have one more question over there, and then we have to just convene out there. So we have sure. to have one question. Fine. 
an extraordinary amount of the risk controversy comes from, to my mind, the last, the least important risk, which is the arguing after an election, uh, the, the litigation, the disappointed candidates, stuff like that. Uh, I mean, I guess you worry about that, uh, Dana, but, but I don't. I'm a voter. I'm not a candidate. The biggest category of risks is the systematic disenfranchisement of voters. The fact that Texas only has a 50 percent political participation rate. That, that's a huge old problem that simply swamps these stupid little uh, controversies. One of the, the biggest single category of disenfranchisement in, in Harris County is that people show up at the wrong precinct. That's called illegal voting. That's a felony on their part. Now, not letting them vote is a misdemeanor, but illegally voting is a felony. So, so you see how biased the law is right out of the, out of the shot. Ironically, one of the things DREs could do is give people who walk into a precinct the opportunity to vote on the ballot they are qualified to vote on. Qualification has nothing to do with you. It's geography. You're, you're only qualified to vote a ballot that you live in that precinct or something. Right? It has nothing to do with you. So it's easy to solve. But no effort is made to solve it. And the largest single category of illegal voting is not felons and non-citizens and dead people. It's people who simply wander into the wrong precinct. And, of course, we shuffle the precincts every year so that your chances of finding the correct <laughs> are fairly small. So any, anyway, these risks assessments need to be done from the voter's standpoint. And I think the, the other myth that needs to be changed is that this has to be the subject of Democrats humiliating themselves in front of, of, of Republicans over anything. There ought to be controversy on this. I don't see why, if a majority of the Republicans want to adopt something, the Democrats won't stand up and vote against it. They lose the vote, but at least they make a point. But forcing everything into <laughs> unanimous consent, I mean, what kind of accountability is that? That's no accountability. I, I don't know what... I don't know what you mean by that as far as... There ought to be an adversarial relationship. This line of code she refers to no, didn't have to be adopted by every single member of the committee from both parties. Okay? You get to debate these sorts of things. And when I started doing this, there were big rip-roaring contests over who was for expanding the franchise and who was keeping it suppressed. Why is this not debatable? You know, why do all the legislators have to agree completely on anything that the vendors are distributing money for? Well, I, you know, I'll, I'll, the only debate that I've participated, the only time this stuff <laughs> no, has come to the floor. No, it's a split vote. It's you vote against something, you lose the vote, and, and, I, I, and I, I, you I, revisit it next year. I, I would, I would, uh, I would dispute your contention that there are not split and contentious votes, particularly over voting issues, and I think there was... Uh, the most recent one I can think of was the, the, the movement to cut back one weekend of early voting, which a whole number of us argued very vociferously and lost, and you don't know about it because it particularly didn't get covered. But, but let, me, let me sort of put a, put a circle on this because I love your point about, about going to the polling place and being able to vote, and my first reaction was, yes, that's what we do in early voting. And then early voting. And, and then, but, then I'll, but then I'll tell you something I found out last time. And this is, this, is the, this is the beautiful thing about every one of these things that you fix causes another problem. Um, one, of the things that, one of the things that I do in my, in looking at my uh, election pool, people, my, my voter list, is I send that voter list off to the post office. And I say to the post office, tell me of, of all these people on the list, who's moved? Who's filed a change of address? And... Clearly, since the post office doesn't forward political propaganda, um, I don't mail to those people because they're not there. I then went back and looked later at uh, particularly the early voting results and found out that a number of the people who weren't there voted in my election. And the reason they voted in my election is that they had never changed their address on voter registration. And when they came into the early voting location, which might have been anywhere in the city, they, somebody looked up not the address they really lived at, but the address they were on the rolls at, and gave them the ballot for my district, even though they clearly no longer lived there. Yeah. They're supposed to say, so, do you still reside at that address? 
And, you know, and it, it works about as well as when I say, have you changed your registration since you moved here? And everybody say, oh, yeah, I have. Well, then how come it's not on the list? And it doesn't mean we shouldn't try to do those things. But the, the, I think what, what we can all agree on is that, is that every time you make a change, you are generating more problems, and those are going to be unanticipated. So this is not something we're going to be able to finish. Yeah. One of the things that I've learned is that hardly anything in elections are simple. And oftentimes when we think something is simple, that just means you haven't dug deep enough yeah. yet. Um, we're, it would be great if I could vote here. I mean, there's people, students at Rice can vote on campus. Very convenient. I'd love to be able to vote here on campus. Instead, I have to vote at a small church near my house. But if you were to allow me to vote here, then how, to, how, do you, how can you figure out whether I've voted more than once? I can just drive around the city to every single one of the polling locations. And so what do you do? You have to have a central computer to track who's voted where. You stamp your card. Like you know, we do can, yeah, right. <laughs> so now if you have that yeah, giant right. central computer, how do you keep that right. thing safe? Because yeah. now it has to be connected to all the precincts. Give everybody a national ID number. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you very quickly open a huge can of worms. Yeah. And I'm not saying that maybe the, the benefit of being able to vote at work might not make it worth the effort, but you still you create a huge engineering problem. Well, and, and the minute that you put and the minute that you you could overcome that by putting those by hooking all those systems together so that if you voted here in three sixty one, they would know it wherever it is that your home precinct was. But the minute you put all those voting systems together into one system, you've created security problems right. that, that work, aggregation of totems. Yeah, that absolutely work against <laughs> right. you. Right. So I and furthermore, if you get this voter registration business wrong, you have something like what happened I, I forget one of the I think Orange County, California had Voters who showed up and the poll workers mistakenly assigned them to the wrong precincts. This was for. Well, and what happened were in some precincts you had more votes cast than voters registered, in other precincts less. And that was a result of poll worker error when you had these combined precincts. Mm -hmm. So every time, whenever. It, the voting is a remarkably fragile and delicate thing. <laughs> And if you like shake it a little bit, you know things fall off. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's something we have to work very carefully on to make it work as well as we can. Yes. I always have more people voting than we're registered. <laughs> yeah, a joke I heard from somebody who was Indian was saying, "How come in the U.S. you have so much trouble getting turnout to the polls? In India, we regularly have more than 100 percent turnout." <laughs> <laughs> so, I think we'll just convene out in the comments. I'd like to thank everybody in the panel.